Now, before finishing, I'd just like to turn to one other area of important reform, that is vaping. When Medicare was getting underway 40 years ago, the biggest public health challenge in Australia was undoubtedly tobacco. So I said 40% of men and 30% of women were regular smokers. And we've done really well on that count. We should be proud. Today, only around 10% of Australian adults smoke. The progress that we've made is, thanks, I have to say, in large part, to the efforts of successive Labor health ministers, particularly my friend and former senior minister, Nicola Roxon, who introduced our world-leading plain packaging reforms. In November last year, on the 10-year anniversary of those laws, I announced our government's intention to build on that legacy and to implement the next generation of tobacco control. But unfortunately, the gains that we have made in tobacco could be undone by a new threat to public health. Vaping was sold to governments and to communities all around the world as a therapeutic product to help long-term smokers quit. It was not sold as a recreational product, and in particular, not one for our kids. But that is what it's become, the biggest loophole, I think, in Australian healthcare history. One in six um, teenagers aged 14 to 17 has vaped. One in four young Australians aged 18 to 24 has also vaped. Only one in 70 my age has vaped. And when more than 1,000 teenagers aged 15 to 17 were asked where they could get vapes, four in five of them said local retail, in retail stores. This is a product deliberately targeted at our kids, being sold alongside lollies and chocolate bars. Vaping has now become the number one behavioural issue in high schools and it's becoming widespread in primary schools as well. Over the past 12 months, Victoria's Poisons Hotline has taken 50 calls about children under the age of four ingesting vapes. Under the age of four. Vapes contain more than 200 chemicals that do not belong in the lungs. Some of the same chemicals you'll find in nail polish remover and weed killer. Just like they did with smoking, let's be very clear about this. Big Tobacco has taken another addictive product, wrapped it in shiny packaging, added sweet flavours, to create a new generation of nicotine addicts. Young vapers are three times as likely to take up smoking. So it is no wonder that under 25s are the only cohort in our population that are seeing smoking rates actually increase. This has to end. This must end. To his credit, the former health minister, Greg Hunt, tried to put border controls in place, but there was a revolt in his party room and that regulation was overturned in two weeks. Instead, the former government ended up creating the perfect conditions for this unregulated, essentially illegal market to flourish right before our eyes in convenience stores, tobacconists, vape shops, sometimes deliberately set up down the road from their target market, local schools. A so-called prescription model with next to no prescriptions, a ban with no real enforcement, an addictive product with no support to quit. Over summer, the Therapeutic Goods Administration, the TGA, consulted health groups and our community and they provided us with a clear roadmap. The first thing to do is to stop the import of vapes that are not destined for pharmacy shelves to be sold as a therapeutic product with the approval of a health professional. To obtain an import permit, an importer will have to show that the vapes that they propose to sell comply with new standards and processes established by the TGA. They will have to be imported for sale only in pharmacies. The import of vapes for sale in retail settings will end. These are supposed to be pharmaceutical products, so they will have to present that way. No more bubblegum flavours, no more pink unicorns, no more, no more vapes deliberately disguised as highlighter pens for kids to be able to hide them in their pencil cases. Instead, we'll have pharmaceutical-style packaging and devices with plain flavours. I also intend to accept the TGA's advice and ban single-use disposable vapes that clog landfill and have become toxic to our environment. Obviously, to make this work, we need the assistance of state and territory governments to close down the sale of vapes outside pharmacies, in convenience stores and the like. 
but I know that my colleagues at state and territory level are just as committed as I am to stamping out this public health menace with a strong national coordinated response. We also all recognise, though, that there is still a therapeutic use for vapes in the right circumstances to help long-term smokers quit or perhaps now also to assist in nicotine addiction that has been caused by vapes themselves. But a script is really hard to come by. Only one in 20 doctors are authorised by the TGA to prescribe vapes to those who need it, and we think this has to change. It will require removing the restrictions on doctors prescribing so that all doctors can write a script for those who really need it. Governments will also consider whether other proper therapeutic pathways should be examined to allow patients to obtain vapes through a pharmacy where they need them. Because a whole new generation of Australians will need support to quit their new nicotine dependency. And they won't be alone in their quest to kick the habit. Next week's budget will include $30 million for support programs to help Australians quit and $63 million for a national evidence-based information campaign with a particular emphasis on young people. And as we stamp out the growing black market in illegal vaping, we also need to prevent young people from trading their vapes for cigarettes, which is why this budget will also include measures to bring smoking rates down, to protect people from taking it up and additional support for current and former smokers to look after their health. Today I announced that tax on tobacco will be increased by 5% per year over the next three years starting on September 1st because we know that a higher priced cigarette is a more unattractive cigarette. We will also align the tax treatment of tobacco products so that products like roll your own tobacco and manufactured sticks are taxed equally. Together, these changes will raise an additional $3.3 billion over the coming four years, including $290 million in GST payments to the states and territories, helping to support our health system and the health of current and former smokers and vapours. More than $260 million will be invested in a new national lung cancer screening program that will prevent more than 4,000 deaths from lung cancer. At-risk Australians will be able to get a lung scan every two years, as recommended by the Independent Medical Services Advisory Committee. Lung cancer is the leading cause of cancer death in Australia, and we know that First Nations communities carry an even higher burden when it comes to rates both of smoking and of cancer, such that cancer is now the leading cause of disease-related death for First Nations people. The budget will also include, therefore, nearly $240 million to address this inequity, with funding to ensure mainstream cancer services are culturally safe and accessible to First Nations people, as well as funding to build the capacity and the capability of the Aboriginal com community-controlled health services sector to support cancer on the ground. And the successful Tackling Indigenous Smoking program, overseen by a wonderful Senior Australian of the Year, Tom Karma, will be extended and will also be widened to reduce vaping among First Nations people as well as smoking. Friends, health ministers are unanimous in their commitment to work together on vaping and tobacco control. Just yesterday, we all agreed to work urgently together to develop the comprehensive, coordinated suite of regulations to make this plan work, because we will not stand by and allow vaping to create another generation of nicotine addicts.